section seven of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter four the new fronde number one defection of conde hitherto the government had been on the whole supported by conde this support was now to be withdrawn the great captain with no sound cause of complaint was literally in the sulks he considered the reward of his merits and services insufficient he was jealous of the permanent political support which by the marriages of his nieces mazarin was acquiring among the great families especially that of vendome and he could not brook the supremacy of the cardinal in the councils of the queen regarding himself as the first man in the kingdom within measurable distance of the crown urged on by the adulation of the young noblesse and by the comparison which de retz drew between himself and the great duke of guise he now determined to break with mazarin it is the course of folly and treason into which he was led by this enmity that constitutes the struggle of the new fronde unlike the parliamentary fronde this movement had absolutely no title to respect the ostensible and in some respects the real cry of the former was the cry for reform but the leaders of the new fronde never even pretended to desire reform their contempt for the bourgeois magistracy was as deep as was their hatred for the patient minister who stood in their path it was a barren aimless and intensely selfish struggle for power the last riot of the feudal spirit in france an opportunity for a quarrel was soon found cond besides presenting demands on his own account required that longueville should have the government of pont de l'arche in normandy a fortress which practically dominated rouen steadfast to his policy of refusing to weaken the royal authority by the grant of fortresses mazarin braved the prince's anger cond furious at the rebuff publicly quarrelled with the cardinal when asked to sign the contract between mercure vendome's son and laura mancini mazarin's niece in a moment all the cardinal's enemies rallied to the attack cond determined to strike his blow by inducing the parlement once more to bring forward the proscription law of sixteen seventeen mazarin met the danger in characteristic fashion he advised the queen to write a letter to himself ordering him to take cond's advice regarding the nomination of all generals and principal officers of the crown no one was to be removed no benefices to be filled up no important resolution come to without his assent and mazarin was to promise to support cond's interest under all circumstances finally the minister was to require the prince's consent to any marriage of members of his family these terms were accepted by cond who in return promised mazarin his support and friendship the submission was in appearance complete and the result was probably what mazarin had intended the frondeurs indignant at this treaty with the common enemy broke with cond mazarin at once turned the feeling to his own advantage he bought up madame de montbazon beaufort's mistress and under her influence the duke at length promised all that was asked him through the duchess of chevreuse who had an old grudge against cond's sister the duchess of longueville and who recognized that in the end the prince would have to yield to the astuteness of mazarin and the firmness of the queen he secured the inactivity of de retz to whom it is said the duchess sacrificed her daughter's honour in payment and of those who followed his lead cond himself by two intemperate acts came to his aid by his demand for the title of prince for his friends la rochefoucauld bouillon and le tremouille he insulted the rest of the noblesse and the queen and mazarin did their best to encourage the opposition which was excited still greater was the irritation caused by the admission of two of the friends of madame de longueville to the privilege most coveted of all distinctions by the ladies of the court of being seated in the presence of the queen 
the guerre de tabouret as it was called from the tabouret or footstool placed before the chair divided the court the noblesse appealed to the queen conde passionately defended his sister's friends the queen and mazarin desired nothing better than to throw upon conde the odium of asking for the distinctions objected to and to acquire the credit of suppressing them they therefore revoked the nominations and earned the formally expressed gratitude of the whole body of the noblesse not content with these acts of arrogance cond was now showing a reckless want of patriotism in encouraging the parlement of bordeaux to a second revolt thus weakening france in the part most open to spanish attack this was the more culpable as the spaniards had been making way on the northeast they had taken la motte au bois and were threatening dunkirk and berg to preserve these two important places was in all the agitations of the moment mazarin's constant anxiety it was in this attitude of anxious hope and of unwavering determination to yield no inch of ground to the foreign enemies of france that the real greatness of mazarin's character was most conspicuous meanwhile the breach between the frondeurs and Condé had been rendered complete a fictitious plot was enacted the authorship of which was equally ascribed to and equally denied by the cardinal and the frondeurs a riot was excited among the paris mob during which a shot was fired into conde's carriage and one of his retainers wounded conde was persuaded that his own assassination had been intended he demanded justice and mazarin affected eagerly to espouse his cause beaufort de retz la bouillaille and Bruxelles were formally indicted for conspiracy each day they appeared in court with their friends and retainers all well armed conde and orleans brought bands of gentlemen similarly prepared for fight into the great hall of justice it seemed momentarily probable that the trial would be changed into a sanguinary conflict in the end the frondeurs managed so to prolong the proceedings that the whole affair was postponed to december twenty ninth but before that day another change had come over the shifting scene conde by his insolent egotism was incessantly playing into mazarin's hands he now roused to exasperation the haughty spirit of anne of austria who had long been chafing under his control by his threats and violence he had compelled her to undergo the humiliation of consenting to receive at court one of his most vicious dependents who had insulted her by a declaration of love he had too in the face of her commands supported the duke of richelieu grand-nephew of the great cardinal in a marriage which brought him entirely under his own influence and in an audacious seizure of havre the most important harbour and fortress of the kingdom the danger of allowing this power to remain in conde's hands was too great to be permitted to continue anne and mazarin supported by orleans whose jealousy of conde had been sedulously fostered determined on a step for which the isolation which conde had created for himself rendered the moment favourable they determined to arrest the prince heavy prices had of course to be paid for the support indispensable to the success of so bold a stroke the interest of beaufort was gained by the gift of the admiralty to his father vendome after it had been refused to conde with reversion to beaufort himself and by that of the viceroyalty of catalonia to mercure the nomination to a cardinalate was promised to de retz and heavy gratifications were given to his friends and to those of madame de chevreuse the utmost secrecy as to the intention of the court having been maintained conde conti and longueville were then suddenly arrested on january eighteenth sixteen fifty and imprisoned at vincennes the net has been thrown well said orleans it has caught at once a lion a monkey and a fox an attempt of conde's immediate friends to create a tumult in paris served only to show how little he could count upon support there on the nineteenth the queen informed the parlement of the reasons for the step and that body as tired as herself of conde's masterfulness received the communication with utmost respect the bourgeois 
mindful of the destruction of their houses and gardens in the suburbs during the siege were equally inclined to concur and paris remained absolutely peaceful number two the fronde in the provinces the capital had been secured it remained to pacify the kingdom conde had warm partisans in normandy burgundy guienne berry champagne and limousin while turenne at stenay a strong fortress commanding the meuse and the great roads to luxembourg and sedan was a constant danger but mazarin's activity was all-sufficing and his skill and patience in dealing with the danger in conciliating where conciliation was possible and in pressing the advantage he had gained by the imprisonment of conde were remarkable he was well aware that imprisonment could not last long he was determined therefore that when the prince was again at liberty he should find himself deprived of his former sources of mischievous power normandy presented the most pressing danger any disturbance there closing as it did the highway of the seine threatened distress and even famine to paris the duke of longueville's officers held the fortresses of pont de l'arche dieppe rouen caen st lo cherbourg and granville the duchess had escaped thither and was doing her best to excite resistance following the plan he ever afterwards adopted mazarin decided while taking ample measures for the safety of the other threatened quarters to lead the queen and the young king into the province before starting he made sure of the fidelity of paris by the distribution of heavy bribes to the leading members of the parlement orleans was left in command but a devoted adherent of the cardinal michel le tellier was placed at his side the court reached rouen on february fifth having received on the way the submission of pont de l'arche the governor of which was easily won by a heavy bribe within fifteen days normandy was safe the duchess of longueville had been compelled to fly dieppe had been secured by force of arms and havre had been obtained from richelieu by the gift of the tabouret to his wife a bribe of twelve thousand crowns bought the submission of the chateau of caen and the title of lieutenant governor of lower normandy to the head of the turbulent family of matignon secured st lo cherbourg and granville all disaffected garrisons and officers were changed and the fortifications of pont de l'arche were destroyed titles of nobility judiciously distributed among the members of the parlement of rouen gained the sympathies of the bourgeoisie on the twenty first the court returned to paris bringing in their train the duke and duchess of richelieu with several of the leading noblesse of normandy as virtual hostages for the fidelity of the province similar successes had been obtained in the other parts of the kingdom dijon the capital of burgundy had surrendered with many more of conde's strongholds stenay and bellegarde on the saone were the only strong places in the north of france which still defied the royal authority in spite of the submission of dijon the temper of the people in burgundy still threatened disturbance and mazarin at once decided to try there also the effect of the king's presence by lavish bribery he again assured the steadfastness of his jealous and temporary allies the duchess of chevreuse was especially insatiable in her demands and mazarin was as ungrudging in satisfying them during the whole of this expedition his correspondence shows him incessantly occupied with keeping unbroken the brittle cords which bound for a time de retz beaufort orleans and the duchesse to his designs the court reached dijon in the middle of march the siege of bellegarde was at once undertaken in spite of the difficulties attending the rainy season mazarin strengthened his force by calling to its aid the troops from weimar who had refused to follow turenne and he heightened the enthusiasm of the soldiers by bringing the young king within the lines a curious scene very characteristic of the nature of the fight now occurred the cries of vivre le roi which went up from the royal troops were raised with equal enthusiasm by the besieged upon the walls they sent word to louis that in honour of his arrival the fire from the place would be suspended for the whole day nor would it be directed toward the quarter where his tent was placed on april eleventh thanks to mazarin's good sense in giving the most favourable conditions the place surrendered 
the commander was taken into favour and the garrison of eight hundred cavalry was incorporated with the royal army stenay now remained the sole rampart of the rebel cause in the north of france there turenne had been joined by the adventurous duchess of longueville who was indefatigable in keeping the spirit of confusion awake among the frondeurs in paris the discontented bordelais and wherever opposition to mazarin was possible she negotiated too an alliance with spain which was met by a royal declaration registered by the parlement on may sixteenth sixteen fifty that the duchess bouillon touraine and la rochefoucauld were guilty of high treason and outlawed and that their property was confiscated to the crown this new alliance had little effect the spaniards indeed took Catelet on june second but they failed before the heroic resistance of the governor of the town of guise no common purpose existed between spain and turenne the former cared only for the enfeeblement of france the latter for securing the family government of sedan scarcely had the court returned from burgundy when it was called away to guienne where under the insistence of the mother of conde the hatred of Epernon, the governor, and offers of help from Spain, the smouldering mass had broken into open flame. Bordeaux shut its gates against the royal forces and refused to accept an amnesty from the benefits of which were excluded only those who had treated with Spain. For all acts of severity on the part of the government, they exacted full reprisals and prepared for a vigorous resistance to a siege that this should last but a short while was for mazarin of the utmost importance for he was confronted by dangers on every side intercepted dispatches proved that bouillon was directly communicating with spain in italy things were going badly for porto longone and piambino had fallen before the spanish attack in the north the spaniards had taken la capelle vervon and marl Turenne had captured Rutel and Chateau Portion, and the flying peasantry were carrying dismay into Paris itself. There, too, the faction of the princes was continually strengthening itself, while the streets were placarded by still another party who appealed to the people to seek their safety in the reconciliation of the various members of the royal family and in the banishment of Mazarin. Orléans was wavering once more and conspiracies had been discovered in normandy mazarin felt the urgent necessity of having his hands free at length on september twenty ninth he secured his end with the appearance of victory by a treaty with the bordelais that in token of obedience the town should suffer a royal entry at the head of the army should lay down their arms and should raise their fortifications while in return epernon was removed the exiled councillors restored and a complete and comprehensive amnesty granted to the city mazarin at once turned to face his enemies at paris and to take the offensive against turenne he refused further bribes to de retz and he determined at all costs to reconquer Rutel and to check the alarming advance of spain with infinite pains he managed to keep the frondeurs still divided and having removed the prisoners to havre for greater security set out with the court for the seat of war reaching reims on december fifth siege was at once laid to Rotel. mazarin himself though suffering severely from gout and gravel took up his quarters in the camp to encourage the soldiers and displayed the utmost activity in providing not only for the greater matters of organization but for all those details in which the well-being of an army consists down to the men's greatcoats. So vigorously was the place attacked that it surrendered on December 13th. Scarcely had the garrison marched out when Turenne appeared to relieve it. His men, however, were tired, and vigorously pushed by the royal troops, he retreated to an impregnable position on rising ground about twenty-two miles from Rotel. It appeared, however, not for the first or last time as though, when engaged in this unpatriotic warfare, the greatest masters of the art lost their skill and judgment. Turenne allowed his army to descend from the heights and spread itself over the intervening valley. Without an instant's hesitation, the royal marshal, Du Plessis Pralon, dashed at them with his whole force. Turenne was in a few minutes utterly routed almost the whole of his infantry 
three thousand five hundred strong were slain the royal troops refusing quarter to all of french blood champagne was cleared of the enemy and even stenay itself prepared for a siege one thing in especial was proved by this campaign with or without conde the royal troops could be counted upon that this was due to mazarin's ceaseless care to render the service popular that the tendency of a standing army to rally to the crown had been strengthened vastly by his management is clear he doubtless felt that come what might he would have to depend upon force in the end it was for this reason that he had caused the young king to live among the troops it was for this too that he was eager for a brilliant success at Rotel, and that he displayed such care for the personal comfort of his soldiers that care did not cease with success i dispatched last evening he wrote to letellier on the sixteenth a great train of bread wine lint and medicines with surgeons to help the wounded and in addition i have sent my own carriages to convey the disabled persons of quality with money for distribution among the officers mazarin might well look back with pride upon what he had accomplished tortured as he was with disease surrounded by open and secret enemies and only wielding his power in the name of an infant king he had allowed no note of weakness to escape him and had met every danger with wary and supple resolution by the imprisonment of conde he had declared that the crown should no longer be defied by any subject however powerful by dexterous management he had secured temporary quiet in the capital and he had then first in normandy then in burgundy afterwards in guienne and now in champagne stifled intestine war and driven the strangers from the soil and as he returned to paris he could boast that no town in france save stenay refused obedience to the king he had created an army devoted to the crown and while stretching conciliation to its limits in the endeavour to unite all frenchmen to labour for one object he had steadfastly refused during the worst periods of danger and doubt to yield the slightest concession to spain mazarin was a great card-player and it was said that he always rose from the table a winner whatever might have been his losses during the game this aptly illustrates his conduct of great affairs no view of his character is more false than that which represents him as a mere political adventurer that is the view which contemporaries blinded by the storms through which his piercing eye saw land and safety might fairly take but ultimate success in designs far distant and hidden from the eyes of others was all he cared for in his determination to compass that he never wavered and he played the great game of politics with a patience a coolness and a dexterous use of every turn of statecraft that compel our wonder even now End of section seven. Section eight of the English Restoration and Louis the Fourteenth by Osmond Airy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter five: The Rebellion of Condé. Number one: Failure of Condé majority of louis the fourteenth mazarin returned to paris as a conqueror he might well have hoped to find his path easy but the jealousy of ministerial absolutism turned his very successes to his disadvantage before the year was out de retz was attacking him with all the old vehemence before the parlement which passed a vote demanding his dismissal it was sustained by the assemblies of the clergy and of the provincial nobility which de retz had brought together in paris and by orleans whose fickle support had once more been secured by this master of intrigue the authority of the regency had for the first time rested upon the alliance of mazarin with either conde or orleans it now stood defenceless once more the queen mindful of charles i and strafford refused to give up her servant but mazarin who recognized that it was in hatred of himself alone that the various parties were united with calmer wisdom determined to withdraw 
on the night of february sixth sixteen fifty one he secretly left paris at lillebonne on the tenth he heard from anne that she had been forced to give orders for the release of the princes before the messenger had reached havre he was there in person if the princes were to be set free he was determined to secure if possible their gratitude by releasing them himself this done he left france and sought the protection of the elector of cologne but though absent he was none the less powerful more than once while in the thick of the confusion he had appeared partially bewildered from a distance he had a far more complete control of the situation and the skill with which he guided the queen through all her difficulties was most remarkable for the moment it doubtless seemed to conde as he entered paris amid the enthusiasm of the streets that the game was in his hands to wrest the regency from the queen summon the etat generaux and frame a new constitution appeared well within his power he soon recognized that such a scheme was hopeless the parliament feared that their privileges would be weakened de retz the duchesse of chevreuse and her friends had no intention of subordinating themselves to cond longueville Molay, bouillon and many others were alienated by his arrogance while the house of vendome was divided through the affection of mercure for mazarin's niece whom he shortly married Condé was soon driven to see that his only chance of supremacy lay in coming to terms with the queen herself his conditions were such that had they been granted he would have been virtual king of france without hesitation mazarin urged the queen to reject them and to form in turn a close agreement with the frondeurs they demanded a frondeur ministry and the nomination to a cardinalate for de retz and on these terms they engaged to further the recall of mazarin and to allow the court to leave paris the mere suggestion of mazarin's recall however brought about in turn an alliance between cond and the parlement the prince left paris and refused to return until the chief official adherents of mazarin had been dismissed the queen replied that she would sooner go into a cloister once again mazarin succeeded in persuading her to give way he felt the necessity of not allowing the understanding between cond and the parlement to become permanent and he knew that with time his best friend would probably be cond himself his hopes were fully justified by his insolent refusal to visit the queen and the king and by his general arrogance the prince rapidly alienated his friends in the parlement and thus robbed himself of his only support across the troubled scene of the last five years the monarchy had been guided up to an event of supreme importance on september seventh with the full concurrence of the parlement which had been gratified by a fresh decree against mazarin and with every circumstance of rejoicing was celebrated the majority of louis the fourteenth the proceedings of the day in which royalty appeared to the people in all its splendour as the personification of the unity and power of france are recorded in great detail from one of the tribunes of the parlement the ambassadors of the foreign powers looked down upon the inauguration of the epoch which was to establish the supremacy of france from the other the exiled widow of charles i gazed upon a scene which must have added by contrast a bitterness to the downfall of all her hopes from the crowd of great nobles one figure alone was absent as louis prepared to set out for the parlement a letter was handed him in which cond expressed his regret that fear for his personal safety prevented him from attending the ceremony the contemptuous refusal of the young king to open the letter well illustrated the changed conditions of the contest from the moment the majority was declared the princes of the blood until now rivals of the crown became subjects and subjects alone nothing was left for conde 
but submission or fighting should he choose the latter he would no longer be fighting only against evil advisers he would be a rebel against a king in the plenitude of his authority supported by the instincts of a nation number two rebellion of conde into rebellion however he threw himself with characteristic impetuosity at bordeaux he was enthusiastically received the great families of la rochefoucauld rohan la force la tremouille also upheld his cause in the south of france Dognon brought him a fleet marson the royal governor of catalonia carried over his best troops thus strengthened and liberally supplied with money and men by spain in return for the possession of a harbour on the dordogne he determined to defy the crown a royal declaration was at once issued depriving the prince of all his honours and governments and attainting him of high treason and the declaration was registered by the parlement on december sixth conde had underrated the resources of the government an immediate progress through poitou saintonge and anjou secured the quiet of these districts harcourt defeated la rochefoucauld relieved cognac and took la rochelle from dognon conde who had hastened to succour la rochelle was himself beaten at tonnay charente and was compelled to fall back upon the dordogne he now sought for allies in one powerful quarter he had great hopes there had for long been existing among the bordelais a strong republican feeling and this had been carefully encouraged by agents from england as early as sixteen fifty the help of england had been formally asked against the government and an offer made in return of a port on the gironde and of la rochelle these offers were now renewed cromwell however prudently sent to the south of france to ascertain the real position of affairs his messenger reported that secure in their religion through mazarin's wise observance of former promises the huguenots gave no sign that the fronde was a frivolous and discredited faction and that as for conde himself stoltis est et garulus et venditur a suis cardinali in another direction conde was equally unsuccessful the duke of lorraine for eighteen years a duke without a duchy was always ready to sell himself and the army with which he wandered on the frontier to the highest bidder conde now applied to him and spain seconded the request but mazarin by holding before him the prospect of a repossession of his estates succeeded for the time in baffling his design the moment had now come for mazarin to reappear on the scene since the middle of october he had transferred his quarters to dinan on the frontier thence he had kept up an active correspondence with such of the governors of the provinces and commanders of the northern fortresses as were in his interest and he had collected there a well-equipped force of seven thousand men the mazarins devoted to himself with this army he crossed the frontier on december twenty fourth and undeterred by the fulminations of the parlement which went so far as to set a price upon his head marched rapidly through france and joined the king and queen at poitiers on january thirtieth sixteen fifty two he had brought with him as the first fruits of the king's majority something more important than even his army or his council he had brought turenne they came at a critical moment conde indeed had again been outmanoeuvred on the dordogne but danger was threatening from the north the duke of nemours had collected a mixed army of french and spaniards and was now marching to join the forces under beaufort which orleans who had once more changed sides had raised between the loire and the seine the emergency was boldly met by mazarin he led the court to the loire and at once took the offensive on march twenty ninth sixteen fifty two beaufort and nemours were beaten by turenne at jargo they immediately marched to montargy to place themselves between paris and the royal forces at this moment conde suddenly arrived in their camp disheartened at his failure in guienne and warned of the danger on the loire he determined to take the command there 
he at once made his presence felt falling by night upon one division of the king's army he routed it and almost captured the court the skill of turenne who came up in haste and who with numbers not a third of those of conde prevented him from pursuing his advantage alone averted a complete disaster to the royal cause conde hereupon betook himself to paris orleans was there in his interest with a considerable force but the parlement though still hating mazarin was unwilling to oppose directly a king whose majority had been declared and above all there was steadily forming itself among the wearied bourgeoisie a fresh party who saw in the success of the crown their only chance of the repose for which they longed thus foiled conde turned to the mob anarchy was soon raging for turenne was gradually hemming in the city and the people were furious with the parlement which seemed powerless to bring their miseries to an end the news that turenne had avenged blenot by a brilliant victory over conde's spanish forces at etampes on may fourth increased the frenzy the populace clamoured for something that should end their suspense and turned their anger against the parlement and conde alike an attack by the royal forces enabled conde to draw the people into participation in the rebellion with an armed but undisciplined mob he inflicted a serious check at st cloud upon turenne who thereupon undertook instead the siege of etampes in which the remains of conde's force were shut up the siege failed through a strange intervention the duke of lorraine marched from the frontier and appeared before paris with his banded army of ten thousand men wasting the country as he came he had come in the pay of spain to help the princes he kept his word by a peaceful agreement with turenne that the siege of etampes should be raised and then outmanoeuvred by that commander and moved by a bribe from mazarin higher than conde could offer returned to the frontier after a fortnight's stay the troops of conde succeeded in escaping from etampes and reaching the suburbs of paris but the city guards angry at the devastation which they witnessed shut the gates and refused them entrance they encamped therefore at st cloud and there conde joined them meantime paris was given up to anarchy the members of the parlement were attacked in the streets and at length that body suspended its sittings many fled to the court mazarin and turenne reinforced by three thousand men now determined to strike the long deferred blow on july second conde's army was caught on the march in the streets of the faubourg st antoine a murderous conflict of several hours in which the prince displayed his accustomed bravery resulted in his total defeat hemmed in between turenne and the walls of paris he would have been utterly crushed had not his friends within the city at the moment when turenne was preparing a final attack thrown open the gates to his shattered troops and checked the further advance of the royalist forces by a cannonade from the bastille the immediate result was further violence and massacre in paris encouraged by conde himself the hotel de ville in which the general assembly of the city which had replaced the parlement was in session was set on fire by the mob and many of the notables were cut down as they endeavoured to escape from the flames conde then coerced the remnants of the parlement to consent to an administration in which orleans was lieutenant-general of the kingdom himself commander-in-chief beaufort governor of the town and Bruxelles provost the court had meanwhile to meet a fresh danger at the beginning of july the archduke leopold who had just taken gravelines and was besieging dunkirk sent a large force with lorraine's troops to the aid of cond turenne retired to compiegne and determined to defend the line of the oise with his eight thousand men the enemy numbered twenty thousand and had the spanish general listened to the prayer of cond and with the prince's help attacked the royal troops the result could hardly have been in doubt but thus decisively to end the war which was every day weakening their great enemy was far from the interests of spain at the critical moment she recalled her army and the danger thus disappeared 
as soon almost as it had arisen lorraine and cond were easily held in check during the whole of september by the superior generalship of turenne number three reaction in paris royal entry in other ways the sky was brightening the massacre of the hotel de ville had disgusted all reasonable men a great reaction took place in paris the bourgeoisie refused to pay the taxes demanded by the provisional government conde's army rapidly dwindled away on august ninth he could muster only twelve hundred men to separate their friends in the parlement from their enemies the court now ordered that body to leave paris and resume its sittings at pontoise Mole, the president and some thirty members obeyed the summons and their numbers increased day by day the court thus gained the advantage of securing the registering of their acts according to the constitution so greatly did louis appreciate their services that to the end of his reign he paid all the members who attended the session of august seventh through october twentieth a pension of six thousand livres under the title of pension de pontoise it did not at first appear that this step was for the interest of mazarin the parlement of pontoise demanded his dismissal this however was obviously a prudent step as it removed conde's last excuse the demand was acceded to with the old readiness and on august nineteenth mazarin left the court to reside at bouillon within paris the party of order continually improved its position so strong was it that on september twenty fourth the bourgeoisie and the clergy determined to invite louis to return the provost of the merchants the principal magistrates the six trade companies with de retz at the head of the priesthood carried the invitation to st germain turenne meanwhile had once more outmanoeuvred the duke of lorraine and compelled him to lead his bands from france cond bitterly disappointed hastened with the remnants of his army to do the same the fickle resolutions of orleans were easily overcome beaufort was induced to give up his governorship for one hundred thousand livres and on october twenty first sixteen fifty two amid a scene of the wildest rejoicing louis the fourteenth at last entered his capital an amnesty was passed for all occurrences since february sixteen fifty one and all decrees issued in the interval including those against mazarin were cancelled mazarin however did not at once return he was busy in putting the army of champagne into such order that turenne was shortly able to drive cond to la capelle and to retake all the towns held by the prince except rethel and saint menehou he was too perhaps unwilling again to appear prominently until he had heard of the exile of his rival chateauneuf of the complete dispersion of the leaders male and female of the fronde and of the arrest of de retz he entered paris on february third sixteen fifty three the earliest opportunity was taken for asserting the triumph of the principles of richelieu and mazarin on the very day after the entry a lit de justice was held at which the parliament was once more forbidden to assume any control over state affairs or to meddle with finance paris was now secure but the provinces were still agitated in provence burgundy and saint ange quiet was soon restored the struggle in guienne however was serious and prolonged bordeaux was under a reign of terror and the violent section of the parlement known as the orme from the fact that its meetings were held in a grove of elm trees refused all the offers of the crown its tyranny however became intolerable to the respectable citizens and led to a dispersion of cond's faction on august third sixteen fifty three bordeaux vigorously pressed by the royal troops opened its gates with this submission the long struggle of the fronde came to an end its result was to leave the monarchy supreme the conflict between royalty and the spirit of feudalism had ended in the complete triumph of the cause which best satisfied the yearning for order and the sentiment of national unity the great nobles had failed because as time went on it became more clear that they had nothing to offer the nation and that their cause was the cause of civil confusion 
they now exchanged their fruitless pretensions to independence for the high commands the titles and the pensions which mazarin showered among them for all the gilded servitude of the court the heads of great houses who had stood in arms against the king henceforth found their chief honour in filling the numberless offices which were created in the household while the younger members of the noblesse were encouraged to seek a career in the one profession which was not beneath the dignity of their order the parlement the only other bodies whose pretensions could be dangerous were sternly kept within the original limits of their constitution but while henceforth they were allowed to occupy themselves with the judicial functions alone mazarin was ever careful that no cause should be given them for discontent by interference with those functions they became once more bodies of magistrates constituting a legal caste all the machinery of a purely centralized administration was rapidly reorganized and in especial the intendants the favourite institution of both richelieu and mazarin were immediately restored even now before she could claim that supremacy in europe to secure which had been throughout all the troubles the guiding ambition of mazarin as it had been of richelieu france had much to accomplish and many dangers to overcome she had to win back the conquests which spain nerveless and inefficient as she had become had been able to wrest from her during the years of confusion piambino porto longone and casale in italy dunkirk mardyke gravelines fuen and other towns in flanders catalonia in spain and she had first to face the final efforts of conde end of section eight section nine of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter six close of the war with spain number one defeat of conde and safety of france the prince had now taken the last step in treason he had formally enlisted in the service of spain and with a mixed force of thirty thousand men appeared in france in the spring of sixteen fifty four turenne could only bring sixteen thousand troops to oppose him but the spirit of his troops was high soon the interest of the war centred around two places arras and stenay the latter was besieged by the french on june nineteenth while arras was at the same moment attacked by cond all europe stood watching the strife for the first success would probably decide the war paris was in a ferment of expectation while circumstances known only to mazarin invested the issue with singular importance cond was indefatigable but he was feebly seconded by his spanish colleagues whose punctilious pride had been annoyed by his arrogance within arras a very different spirit reigned the defences of the town were weak and the inhabitants were spanish but the governor had no thought of surrender and the officers of the garrison swore to one another to die at their posts meanwhile their brethren outside stenay encouraged by the presence of louis pushed the siege with such vigour that on august fifth the town capitulated and the besiegers at once hurried off to attack conde before arras a desperate effort of the prince to carry the place before these forces came up failed on the twenty fourth turenne by a night attack forced his lines and compelling him to retreat in confusion pursued him almost to the walls of brussels the northern frontier was now safe the treason of arcourt the governor of alsace and philipsburg who had taken possession of breisach and had assumed the position of an independent prince gave mazarin an opportunity of securing also the frontier of the rhine unable at first to bribe the commander the cardinal bribed his men arcourt finding himself defenceless listened to the minister's offers of fifty thousand livres and mazarin took the governments of alsace and philipsburg into his own hands before the beginning of the next campaign took place a scene which marked the distance over which the monarchy had moved since the beginning of mazarin's career 
on march twentieth sixteen fifty five a lit de justice was held for imposing taxes rendered necessary by the war louis was hunting at vincennes when the news reached him that the parliament was discussing the new acts with the view of remonstrating suddenly he appeared unannounced in the palais de justice in the dress in which he had ridden hard from vincennes and with marks of anger in his face intervening at once in the discussion he expressed his surprise at this audacity curtly forbade the continuation of the proceedings and then left the hall as abruptly as he had entered it the parlement never again ventured to incur a similar rebuke the same lesson was taught in a still higher quarter the pope refused to declare that a vacancy had been caused in the archbishopric of paris by de retz's forced resignation in prison a compromise was arranged but the pope insisted that the terms of the agreement should receive the sanction of the assembly of the clergy and of the parlement mazarin unhesitatingly refused the condition in the most emphatic terms he laid down the doctrine that the absolute and despotic power in france was with the king and that no organization whatsoever in the kingdom could pretend to the smallest share and it illustrates the national and anti-papal character of the gallican church that mazarin was strongly supported by the clergy in this position the summer campaign of sixteen fifty five was little more than a military parade on foreign ground everywhere france was now on the offensive fortress after fortress was captured and in november the leaderless army of the duke of lorraine who had been arrested by the spaniards and imprisoned in madrid was taken into french pay fortune was more evenly balanced in italy and catalonia though there too the french had more than held their own number two the english alliance mazarin was now bent upon an alliance which if successful must finish the war a deadly blow would be struck at the strength of spain if dunkirk mardic and gravelines the possession of which was of vital importance to her communication with flanders as well as enabling her to ruin french commerce on that coast could be wrested from her for this the cooperation of some maritime power was necessary and mazarin determined at all costs to secure england with cromwell the only diplomatist by whose astuteness he confessed himself baffled he had been negotiating since sixteen fifty one but up to this moment with no result in sixteen fifty four the protector found himself courted by both the great powers he told them the terms on which his help might be had in each case they were dictated by the two main principles of his policy the desire to make england mistress of the seas with a foothold on the continent and the desire to protect protestantism from spain he must have calais when taken from the french freedom of trade with the american colonies and a cessation of all attacks by the inquisition upon english merchants in spain the first condition met with no favour in spain since it would place her communication with the netherlands at the mercy of england to the second and third she returned a flat refusal to grant them she said would be giving up the king's two eyes from france cromwell demanded dunkirk when captured from the spaniards and promise of toleration for the huguenots and mazarin was ready to accede to these terms mutual jealousies and varying interests hindered an understanding and the massacre of the protestant waldenses in piedmont by the duke of savoy would have caused the negotiations to be broken off had not mazarin yielded to cromwell's demand and compelled the duke to grant the survivors favourable terms at length on november third sixteen fifty five a treaty was signed at westminster based upon freedom of commerce and an engagement that neither country should assist the enemies or rebels of the other mazarin consented to expel charles the second and james and twenty named royalists from france cromwell similarly agreed to dismiss from england the emissaries of cond but mazarin was soon anxious for a more effectual bond the french army had sustained a grievous disaster 
by a victory of Condé at Valenciennes, July 15, 1656, which threatened the loss of all the advantages of the campaign. The financial embarrassments, too, were very great. The army was unpaid, and peasant risings were taking place in various parts of the kingdom. Cromwell had equally good reasons for drawing closer to France, for Spain was preparing actively to assist Charles II. French and English interests thus coinciding, an alliance was signed at Paris on March 23, 1657. Gravelines and Dunkirk were to be at once besieged both by land and sea. England was to send 6,000 men to assist the French army. Gravelines was to become French and Dunkirk English. Should the former fall first, it was to be held by England until Dunkirk too was taken. Mazarin disarmed the hostility felt by the French clergy to such an alliance with heretics by a clause preserving the Catholic religion in any towns taken by the English. The danger that England might gain too strong a hold on the continent was guarded against by her promise to attack no other towns in Flanders. The alliance was not a moment too soon. The campaign of 1657 had opened disastrously. The tide was, however, turned by the arrival of the English contingent. Montmédy was immediately besieged and capitulated on August 4th. The effect was again to make Mazarin hang back from further effort, since it seemed possible now to make peace with Spain and thereby avoid an English occupation of Dunkirk. But Cromwell would stand no trifling, and his threats were so clear that Mazarin determined to act loyally and without delay. On September 30th, Turenne laid siege to Mardyk, which protected Dunkirk, and took it in four days it was at once handed over to the English. Mazarin had meanwhile gained an important diplomatic success. The Emperor Ferdinand III had died on April 1, 1657. Mazarin knew that in breach of the Treaty of Westphalia he had been constantly sending help to Spain, and that Leopold, his son, was now doing the same. He determined to seize the opportunity of depriving his enemy of so important a source of support. For the next eighteen months he exhausted all the resources of diplomacy to oppose Leopold's succession to the imperial title, putting forward first Louis the Fourteenth and then the elector of Bavaria as rival claimants. To secure his election, Leopold found himself compelled by the electors whom Mazarin had won by wholesale bribery to sign a capitulation, by which he bound himself to observe with scrupulousness the terms of the Peace of Westphalia. On August 14, 1658, Mazarin managed further to form the Rhine League, by which six of the electors, with the King of Sweden, joined with France in an engagement to compel Leopold during three years faithfully to observe his word. The expense incurred by France was ruinous but the need of neutralizing Leopold's sympathies with Spain was immediate, and the value of the influence gained in German affairs was of vital importance to Mazarin's future plans. Meanwhile, the great blow had been struck in the north. At the demand of Cromwell, a fresh agreement had been made in the spring of 1658, by which the siege of Dunkirk had without further delay been begun. Under Turenne's command, and encouraged by the presence of Louis, the combined English and French forces worked with desperate energy against the almost insuperable difficulties of the position, aggravated as they were by bad weather, want of provisions and munitions of war, and eruptions of the ocean. On June tenth, Turenne learned that Don Juan of Austria and Condé, accompanied by the Dukes of York and Gloucester, at the head of some English royalist regiments, had arrived at Furnes intending to force his lines leaving sufficient men to continue the siege he at once marched to meet them so confident were the spanish commanders in their numbers and so inefficient was don john himself that all proper precautions were neglected conde knowing to whom he was opposed foresaw the coming disaster turning to the young duke of gloucester he asked him if he had ever seen a battle the duke replied that he had not 
then said conde in half an hour you shall see how one can be lost he was not deceived the picked spanish infantry supported by the english and irish auxiliaries under james held the dunes or low sand hills on the right straight up against them sinking deep in the sand at each step went the ironsides with an impetuous valour which was the wonder of all who saw conde on the left met turenne's onslaught with such desperate energy that he twice repulsed him and nearly broke through his lines but in the end the discipline of the ironsides and the skill of turenne won a crushing victory at the battle of the dunes june thirteenth sixteen fifty eight dunkirk immediately surrendered and on the twenty fifth was in cromwell's possession two months later gravelines also fell a short and brilliant campaign followed in which don john and conde shut up in brussels and tournay respectively were compelled to remain inactive while fortress after fortress fell into french hands a few days after the fall of gravelines cromwell died september third sixteen fifty eight but mazarin was now near his goal utterly defeated on her own soil beaten too by the portuguese at elvas and threatened in milan her army ruined her treasury bankrupted without a single ally in europe spain stood at last powerless before him the rest he felt was but the work of diplomatic skill and in diplomatic skill now that cromwell was dead he had no master to him the prospects of peace were at least as welcome as to spain for france so terrible was her exhaustion after thirty years of ceaseless foreign and civil war maintained only by taxation of crushing severity was from every corner of her devastated departments literally crying aloud for repose number three the peace of the pyrenees the treaty between france and spain dealt in the first place with accomplished facts by a preliminary arrangement on february sixteen fifty nine all the conquests made by france previous to the english alliance were to remain hers for ever but the places captured by turenne in the last campaign except mardique which was held by france and dunkirk which was retained by england with valence mortara in italy and several towns in catalonia were to be restored to spain artois with the exception of air and saint omer roussillon and alsace became french soil while by the cession of many fortresses in luxembourg Hainaut, and flanders her foot was planted firmly in the low countries bound in honour and gratitude to do what they could for conde the spanish ministers urged his restoration not only to all his possessions but to his governments and dignities as well the demand was at this stage formally and decisively refused by mazarin but it was the future rather than the present which as usual most occupied mazarin's thoughts just as in the peace of westphalia he had been looking to the future weakening of the power of austria when he helped to secure the independence of the separate german states so now he was looking to the future absorption of the spanish monarchy into that of france when treating for what had long been looked to as a foremost condition of peace between the two kingdoms the marriage of louis with the infanta the grounds of his expectation lay in the peculiarity of the spanish law of succession a peculiarity which dated from the eleventh century not only did the crown descend to the daughter where no male heirs in direct descent were living but contrary to the custom of Europe, it was by her carried to her husband. It was this law by which in 1217 Castile and Leon, and in 1479 Castile and Aragon were united, and which by the marriage of Jean La Folle, the heiress of the Spanish monarchy to Philippe le Bel, the heir to the Austrian dominions and the Low Countries, made their son, Charles V, the sovereign of nearly half the known world but in sixteen twelve when the marriage of louis the thirteenth and anne of austria opened up the possibility of a combination still more threatening the union namely of the french and spanish crowns the general alarm of europe and the national jealousy in spain brought about a breach of this law the contract of marriage then drawn up 
contained an entire renunciation by anne of all pretensions to the spanish throne by herself and her descendants and this renunciation was after the marriage reaffirmed both by herself and louis the thirteenth a similar renunciation was now insisted upon on the part of marie therese and louis the fourteenth mazarin exhausted all his art to evade the spanish demand the prospect of this succession had been foremost in his mind ever since sixteen forty six when he was hoping to come to terms with spain before the peace of westphalia and now although there seemed no present likelihood of the renunciation being referred to since in sixteen fifty eight and sixteen fifty nine two sons were born to philip the fourth and the claims of the infanta would be dormant during their lives yet these sons being both delegate one died in sixteen sixty and the other in sixteen sixty one his anxiety to avoid the renunciation was as great as though no such obstacle existed failing in this mazarin as usual gained his ends by indirect means he demanded a dowry of five hundred thousand crowns with the infanta of which one-third was to be paid on the day before the marriage and he refused to proceed with the treaty until this demand was agreed to he then instructed his secretary leon to whom was entrusted along with don pedro coloma the task of drawing up the contract to procure the insertion of a clause setting forth that the validity of the renunciation should be dependent upon the punctual payment of these sums after much diplomatic fencing the skill of leon overcame the reluctance of coloma and this condition which contains the key to the french policy of the next four years was duly included in the contract whether from inability to raise the money or more probably because coloma having died in the interval the condition was overlooked by the spanish ministers the first sum had not been paid when the marriage took place and the renunciation was therefore invalid on the next day mazarin and leon were able to congratulate one another upon having thus completely outwitted spain the question of portugal had next to be settled that kingdom had in sixteen forty recovered its independence and the duke of braganza under the title of john the fourth had since worn the crown he had from that time been a thorn in the side of spain and had been actively assisted by france so anxious was mazarin not to lose this source of support in the future that he actually offered to restore to spain all the french conquests in the low countries if the independence of portugal might be recognized in the treaty but spain had set her mind upon reducing this rebellious province and all that mazarin could obtain for her was a truce of three months while on the part of the king of france it was promised that he would never directly or indirectly give to her any aid whatsoever public or secret it will however be seen that when a convenient time came this promise was easily evaded on one other point mazarin found himself compelled to give way conde's future again occupied a large part of the conferences which he held with don luis de haro at the isle of pheasants in the bidishoa river de haro threw over the preliminary treaty in this respect and demanded in the most pressing manner that conde should be fully restored mazarin at length yielded the prince was reinstated in his possessions honours and dignities receiving the government of burgundy with possession only of dijon and saint louis de lone instead of guienne and the dignity of grand master of the household for his son but mazarin gained an ample equivalent aven one of the most valuable towns in Hainaut, with philippeville and marienburg as well as the territory of conflans under the pyrenees were ceded to france while the duchy of juliers was restored to her ally the duke of neuburg moreover as mazarin said conde now gained no more than he certainly would have received after giving in his submission to the king finally the duke of lorraine was provided for he was re-established in his duchy with the exception of moyonvic and the districts of bar and clermont stenay dun and jarmetz which became french he was compelled to promise that he would join no league against france and would allow her armies to pass freely through his territory the importance with which this settlement was invested throughout europe was seen in the presence 
at the place of conference of deputies from sweden austria germany the commonwealth of england and the exiled charles the second sweden and the rhine leagues were clamorous for the aid of france against the emperor who again in defiance of the treaty of westphalia had invaded pomerania the affairs of england too received much attention both spain and france were well disposed toward charles but it was important for france to have the good will of england in view of a possible renewal of the war and england at present meant the commonwealth mazarin therefore declined charles's offers including his proposal to marry the cardinal's niece hortense mancini and when restored to hand over the government of ireland and refused to help in his restoration further he satisfied lockhart the english ambassador by agreeing that charles should not be allowed to employ the forces which conde would leave when taken back into favour with respect to the war which continued between spain and england it was agreed that france should preserve a complete neutrality such were the principal provisions of the peace of the pyrenees which gave a short period of repose to southern europe for Spain, it was what the Peace of Westphalia had been for Austria, a confession of weakness and mark of decline. For France, it was, as that peace had also been, a fresh step toward European supremacy. But France, though she had gained much, though her boundaries were now the Rhine and the crest of the Pyrenees, though she had prepared for the future by the formation of the Rhine League and the Spanish marriage, and though she had established a foothold among the fortresses of the north-east had unhappily both for herself and europe been unable to force from spain that complete rampart for paris the determination to secure which had been the main reason for the earnestness with which throughout all the difficulties of the last fifteen years she had bent herself to the war and so it was that what might have been a lasting peace was indeed only a truce the attempt to make good this unfulfilled desire forms the subject matter so to speak of the intrigue and the fighting of the next eighteen years end of section nine section ten of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond airy this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter seven Restoration of Monarchy in England number one Conditions of the Restoration Louis the fourteenth, after the fever fit of the Fronde, had entered upon his sovereignty by the right of conquest, unshackled by any constitutional authority, and unbound by any conditions. In England, too, monarchy was within a year after the peace of the pyrenees re-established amid all the signs of popular rejoicing and with greetings as apparently servile as those offered to louis himself and yet charles was bound hand and foot by conditions the failure to fulfil which would in all probability have relegated him once more to a wandering life among the courts of europe that this was so arose from the all-important fact that speaking roughly he was restored by those who had overthrown his father and who were responsible for his own exile the fleet the army the fortresses were in their hands england had it is true shaken off at length the military despotism by which cromwell had cut right athwart the most cherished traditions of english life like an unstrung bow she had fallen back upon her old ways of life she had restored her parliament and then parliament and monarchy being coordinated in the english mind she had restored her king this government was as natural to them as their food or raiment and naked indians dressing themselves in french fashion were no more absurd than englishmen without a parliament and a king but having thrown off first the despotism of charles i and then the despotism of military force the country had no thought of taking another the new reign must take account of the feelings which had grown up during the overthrow and abeyance of monarchy that charles fully recognized the position 
was seen in his own words some months later to the house of lords when he spoke of those who brought or permitted us to come here the people might it was hoped in their impatience be deceived by the professions made but made they must be the declaration of breda was admirably suited to the object in view by the most careful expression of deference to the authority of the parliament charles trusted to lull suspicion until he was steady enough upon the throne to use his constitutional power of dissolution at a favourable moment and thus to secure a parliament more to his wishes the foremost question in men's minds was how far the spirit of retaliation was likely to go had the restoration instead of being the re-establishment of parliamentary government been the work of a victorious royalist movement the passions roused would have been quenched the accumulated injuries of years avenged in torrents of blood but the declaration granted a general pardon to all who within forty days after its publication should by any open act return to loyalty and obedience excepting only such persons as shall hereafter be accepted by parliament the king's word was indeed solemnly passed for an absolute oblivion of all acts committed against him or his father in the letter to the speaker accompanying the declaration however a significant hint was given if there be a crying sin for which the nation may be involved in the infamy that attends it we cannot doubt that you will be as solicitous to redeem and vindicate the nation from that guilt and infamy as we can be the question of the church was treated under the same conditions the presbyterians were looking forward with eager anxiety the anglican churchmen with exultant hope to quiet the one but in terms which might afterwards leave the field clear to the other charles proclaimed on his own account a complete liberty to tender consciences declaring himself ready to consent to such an act of parliament as upon mature deliberation shall be offered to us for the full granting that indulgence the resettlement of the land was next dealt with during the wars many estates had changed hands the crown lands and those of church dignitaries had been confiscated by the commonwealth and sold about them nothing was said in the declaration as to private estates either granted away by the commonwealth or sold by distressed royalists the decision was left absolutely in the hands of parliament in another matter the declaration expressed how completely the restoration was one of sufferance it concluded with a promise to consent to any act of parliament for the full satisfaction of all arrears due to the officers and soldiers of the army under the command of general monk and to receive them into the royal service upon as good pay and conditions as they now enjoy the recognition of the absolute authority of parliament in questions regarding the church and the land the complete waiving of a desire for personal vengeance the satisfaction of monk's army these were the conditions under which charles was allowed to return to england the composition of the executive government expressed the nature of the compromise the privy council was really nominated by monk and was composed in a great degree of leading presbyterians out of this however was formed a small committee which practically had the whole control of affairs edward hyde now earl of clarendon was lord chancellor and was so supreme that the years from sixteen sixty to sixteen sixty seven are fitly named the clarendon administration with him was ormond who projected into this reign the high-toned virtues of the old cavalier stock southampton the lord treasurer and nicholas the secretary these four represented the principle of legitimacy in its purest form on the other hand monk and his confidant morris were included while lord robarts who had fought against the king was made viceroy of ireland scotland was placed under middleton a rude soldier of fortune who had served on both sides number two partial fulfilment of the declaration of breda 
the indemnity bill was taken up at once charles and clarendon were determined that in this respect the declaration should be carried out as loyally as the prevailing temper might allow and they managed at least to confine the spirit of retaliation within intelligible lines a broad distinction was drawn between the regicides those namely who had committed the crying sin and all others about the former the majority of the house of commons had little hesitation the true presbyterian abhorred the crime of the king's death as much as the royalist they began on june fifth by accepting from the benefits of the act five of the judges for life and estate on the eighth three more were added and the next day twenty more for pains and penalties not extending to life it was not until july eleventh and then only in consequence of an urgent message from charles that with some further additions the bill passed the lower house in the lords a far more savage spirit reigned the earl of bristol was the spokesman of the majority when he complained that the bill was miserably inadequate though he thought that delay was even a worse evil than an incomplete revenge on july twentieth the lords resolved that all who had signed the warrant should die and three days later they included all who were concerned in the murder once more charles intervened but for his promise he told the lords plainly neither he nor they would have been there his own honour and the public security alike demanded an indemnity for all except those immediately guilty of his father's death with amendments which the commons would not accept the bill passed the lords on august tenth in the conferences between the houses the feeling of the lords was expressed in a demand for the death of four members of cromwell's high court of justice in revenge for the death of four of their own number condemned by that court the victims to be chosen by the relatives of the slain peers the commons however refused to entertain the proposal hoping in full accord with charles and clarendon that their lordships would not have the sacrifice of the king's blood to be mingled with any other blood at length on august twenty ninth the bill passed besides the exceptions already mentioned hacker and axtel who were not among the king's judges were accepted for life while in the case of vane and lambert though they as men of mischievous power and activity were accepted it was understood that a pardon should be granted them and it was further determined that those who had given themselves up should be tried but if convicted should not be executed without a special act of parliament the trial which followed is famous because orlando bridgman interpreting the events of the last thirty years then established the present view of monarchical immunity and ministerial responsibility the king's person he laid down is inviolable he is directly subject to god alone and no authority whatever can exercise coercive power over him the full responsibility of ministers was affirmed with equal emphasis with the exceptions mentioned every act committed against the state between june first sixteen thirty seven and june twenty fourth sixteen sixty was forgotten at the price of some twenty lives the universal fear was removed it should not be forgotten that it was principally owing to charles and clarendon that after a civil war which had its roots in the deepest feelings which can stir men's minds after a despotism which triumphant as it placed england among european nations had roused the bitterest resentment the restoration of the old order was accomplished with bloodshed which when compared with the provocations which seemed to call for vengeance was well-nigh insignificant life was now safe it remained to give the same security to property with regard to the crown lands those of the church dignitaries and in a few cases those of private owners who had been forcibly dispossessed no action was taken either by the court or the parliament until the dissolution they then in the natural course of law since their confiscation had been illegal reverted to their original owners the question of private estates however was a different one those royalists who had voluntarily sold their lands looked eagerly forward to regaining them 
but here to their indignant disappointment clarendon stood firm in his assertion of the sanctity of private contract and the bill of sales decreed the confirmation of all transfers made with the owner's consent probably to no act of his administration did clarendon owe more odium as for none did he deserve more credit than to his integrity in this affair another matter of the first importance for the stability of the restored government was then taken in hand both charles and the commons were eager for the disbanding of the army to the king principally composed as it was of the soldiers who had served cromwell and whose acquiescence in charles return was largely mixed with sullen jealousy it formed a standing menace in the presence of such a force the monarchy could not breathe freely but charles had another reason little guessed at the time it is now known that he had formed the deliberate intention of dissolving parliament as soon as the troops were disbanded wresting all the power from the presbyterians and with the help of foreign money raising an army for himself independent of any other authority his people were as eager for the disbanding as he was the cost of maintenance alone seventy thousand pounds a month was no light burden but of all the feelings roused by cromwell's rule hatred of his military despotism was the deepest it finds eloquent expression throughout the reign and has entered the statute book in the mutiny and riot acts in the debate on august thirtieth william morris aptly expressed the general feeling when he said that as long as the soldiery continued there would be a perpetual trembling in the nation they were inconsistent with the happiness of any kingdom the keeping of the army on foot was like a sheep's skin and a wolf's skin which if they lie together the former loses its wool the nation he said cannot appear like itself whilst the sword is over them monk willingly co-operated in the step though it at once robbed him of his extraordinary position his utmost wishes were satisfied the rude soldier of fortune had fallen upon times which gave ample scope for his peculiar genius he had played the game with incomparable dexterity and had won the stakes he had been made gentleman of the bedchamber knight of the garter master of the horse commander-in-chief and duke of albemarle with a pension of seven thousand pounds a year and he had nothing more to desire in england fourteen regiments of horse and eighteen of foot in scotland one of horse and four of foot were disbanded charles however took advantage of the sudden rising of a few fanatics in the streets of london to retain the coldstream guards and a regiment of horse with one of the regiments which formed the garrison of dunkirk in all about five thousand men one instance of the growth of modern constitutional ideas was the doctrine of ministerial responsibility laid down by bridgman another was the adoption of the principle that the whole nation should pay to get rid of an abuse even when a single class is benefited by its abolition in settling the royal revenue the feudal tenures which pressed solely upon the landed interest with the court of wards were swept away and the money was raised instead from the excise which having been raised originally by the long parliament to defray the expenses of the war against the king was now perpetuated it is no wonder that vehement debates took place upon the proposal and that while political economists like ashley cooper and maynard were supporters of the change it was opposed both by crotcheteers like prynne and by statesmen like ansley there remained but one question but that a question of supreme importance the settlement of church government the restoration had been the joint work of episcopalian and presbyterian would it be possible to reconcile them on this question too the presbyterian indeed was willing enough for a compromise for he had an uneasy feeling that the ground was slipping from beneath his feet of charles's intentions he was still in doubt but he knew that clarendon was the sworn friend of the church 
the churchman on the other hand was eagerly expecting the approaching hour of triumph it soon appeared that as king and parliament so king and church were inseparable in the english mind that indeed the return of the king was the restoration of the church even more than it was the restoration of parliament in the face of the present presbyterian majority however it was necessary to temporize the former incumbents of church livings were restored and the commons took the communion according to the rights of the church but in other respects the presbyterians were carefully kept in play charles taking his part in the elaborate farce by appointing ten of their leading ministers royal chaplains and even attending their sermons the state of things was faithfully reflected in parliament as early as july ninth words had been used which concisely expressed the determination of the church there was said heneage finch the solicitor general no question as to her religion and for the rest he knew of no law for altering the government of the church by bishops in any case he hoped they would not cant after cromwell it was not to be expected that a presbyterian majority should tamely fall in with this ignoring of past years after prolonged debate and amid a scene of unusual disorder the question was shelved by a resolution desiring charles to select a number of divines to debate the whole matter he willingly undertook the task but was soon undeceived regarding the likelihood of a compromise a barren discussion was begun in writing between the anglican and presbyterian divines we agree with you in the main said the presbyterians but we wish certain minor matters altered if you agree with us in essentials the anglicans replied it is mere scruple-mongering to dispute about trifles charles now took the matter more completely into his own hands by issuing a declaration refusing on the ground of constraint to admit the validity of the oaths imposed upon him in scotland by which he was bound to uphold the covenant and not concealing his preference for the anglican church as the best fence god hath yet raised against popery in the world he asserted that nevertheless to his own knowledge the presbyterians were not enemies to episcopacy or a set liturgy and were opposed to the alienation of church revenues the declaration then went on to limit the power of bishops and archdeacons to a degree sufficient to satisfy many of the leading presbyterians one of whom reynolds accepted a bishopric charles then proposed to choose an equal number of learned divines of both persuasions to discuss alterations in the liturgy meanwhile no one was to be troubled regarding differences of practice the majority in the commons at first welcomed the declaration the scheme was indeed wide enough to take in all but an insignificant fraction of the presbyterians and a bill was accordingly introduced by sir matthew hale to turn the declaration into a law but clarendon at any rate had no intention of thus bulking the church of her revenge anticipating hale's action he had in the interval been busy in securing a majority against any compromise the declaration had done its work in gaining time and when the bill was brought in it was rejected by one hundred and eighty three to one hundred and fifty seven votes parliament was at once december twenty fourth dissolved the way was now open for the riot of the anglican triumph even before the new house met the mask was thrown off by the issuing of an order to the justices to restore the full liturgy the conference indeed took place in the savoy palace it failed like the hampton court conference of james i because it was intended to fail upon the two important points the authority of bishops and the liturgy the anglicans would not give way an inch both parties informed the king that anxious as they were for agreement they saw no chance of it this last attempt at union having fallen through the government had their hands free and their intentions were speedily made plain End of section ten section eleven of the english restoration and louis the fourteenth by osmond Airy.
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 8 Triumph of Anglican Church Relations with the Continent. Number 1 Persecution of Dissent. The extent of the reaction which had followed far more than it caused the restoration was disclosed when the new parliament met on may eighth sixteen sixty one its composition was ominous to the presbyterians a parliamentary movement had become a royalist revel there now appeared in a house of more than five hundred members but fifty-six of the old majority the great mass of the members were prepared to go all lengths in favour of the church and clarendon in his opening speech looked forward with confidence to their providing that neither king laws nor parliament may be so used again for a time the existence of an assembly actuated by such a spirit was a source of the greatest danger the decrees of the convention parliament were in the eye of the law illegal until confirmed by a constitutionally appointed body among them was the indemnity bill and there now appeared a serious prospect of some tampering with this the primary condition of the restoration settlement fortunately charles was firm to this part at least of his engagements his earliest message to the house and the need of such a message marks the danger was a distinct refusal to pass any bill whatsoever until this act should be put beyond dispute the commons then applied themselves to repairing the breaches of the constitution having imposed the taking of the sacrament according to the prescribed liturgy on all their members they first ordered the solemn league and covenant to be burnt by the hangmen they then restored the bishops to their seats in the house of lords a step to which charles was personally opposed as tending to raise a serious obstacle to the accomplishment of his desire for toleration of the catholics an act was next passed strengthening the law of high treason and rendering incapable of public employment any one who should affirm the king to be a heretic or a papist the long parliament was declared to be dissolved and the assertion that there could be any legislative authority in either or both houses without the king was rendered a penal offence parliament then in the full tide of loyalty declaring it to be their duty to undeceive the people who have been poisoned with an opinion that the militia of the nation was in themselves or in their representatives in parliament handed back to the king the entire control of the sea and land forces with sixteen forty one in their minds they passed a bill to limit the right of petitioning and declared that no war offensive or defensive could be lawfully levied against the king to whom also the power of veto was restored at one point however they stopped short there was not the slightest intention of making the crown independent the convention parliament had already given charles a life revenue of one million two hundred thousand pounds it was well known that this was insufficient but there was no proposal to increase it on november twentieth sixteen sixty one the houses reassembled in a state of great excitement rumours had been spread of presbyterian plots in various parts of the country and even without this incentive the majority were eager for a drastic expression of anglican supremacy the chief seats of presbyterian feeling were the corporations of towns and it was these bodies which in many cases returned members to parliament by the corporation act december nineteenth sixteen sixty one this source of presbyterian influence was swept away at a blow and a cogent argument offered to weak-kneed presbyterians to reconcile themselves with the dominant church three conditions were declared essential for admission into any municipality the renunciation of the solemn league and covenant the acceptance of an oath denying the lawfulness of taking arms against the king and especially of that traitorous position of taking arms by his authority against his person or against those commissioned by him and finally the taking the sacrament according to the english church the bill passed in the commons without difficulty 
in the lords however it met with considerable opposition at the hands of ashley cooper now lord ashley and other noblemen of the old presbyterian party helped in this instance by the lord treasurer southampton the determination of the commons was increased by the knowledge that charles himself in spite of his concurrence in this act was opposed to stringency toward the dissenters his financial necessities gave them the complete control of the situation and they now used their power to wring from him a personal declaration of allegiance to the church on march first sixteen sixty two he addressed the house complaining of the unworthy suspicions against him declaring himself as zealous for the church and as much in love with the book of common prayer as could be wished and expressed his desire that the house should pass an act of uniformity at once he was supplied with money and was then called upon to fulfil his part of the bargain the corporation act had practically destroyed presbyterianism in the state the act of uniformity now destroyed it in the church it first declared that no one might hold a living in the church unless he had before st bartholomew's day august twenty fourth sixteen sixty two publicly read the service from the new prayer book which had been undergoing revision by convocation in the sense most objectionable to the presbyterians and had declared his unfeigned assent and consent to everything contained therein to express in the strongest manner the exclusiveness of the church and to stamp her with that national and political character which she has ever since held all connection with the protestant churches of the continent was broken off by the clause which forbade any one whose orders had been obtained abroad to continue in his benefice or to administer the sacraments without reordination by the bishop the act further provided that all incumbents holders of university offices schoolmasters and private tutors should in addition to taking the oaths prescribed by the corporation act renounce the covenant promise to conform to the liturgy and to endeavour no change or alteration of government either in church or state the same tests omitting only the renunciation of the covenant were imposed upon all the military forces of the kingdom and upon the lords lieutenants and deputy lieutenants in the case of the clergy no circumstance of aggravation was omitted the day named for submission had been chosen with rare malice the great tithes their chief support would since they were not due until michaelmas pass to the new incumbents and no provision being made for the maintenance of the deprived ministers as had been made in the case of the anglican clergy ejected under the commonwealth they would be thrown on the world destitute of support a still more flippant disregard for justice was shown in the fact that as the revised prayer book was not published until st bartholomew's eve the presbyterians were called upon to express their unfeigned assent and consent to everything contained in a book they had not yet seen from their fellow dissenters the presbyterians received no encouragement the catholics and members of the protestant sects except in the case of a few independents held no benefices and were therefore untouched by the act nor had they any cause to love the presbyterians whose hand had formerly been heavy upon them moreover they were anxious about their own fate and they might well hope that if the lot of the presbyterians were made the same as their own their large numbers must before long lead to a general measure of toleration they found hope in an unexpected quarter both charles and clarendon were opposed to the rapid growth of the persecuting spirit the former because of the obstacles it placed in the way of favouring the catholics clarendon from fear of disturbance and revolt on march seventeenth the chancellor endeavoured in vain to introduce a clause enabling the king to dispense with the provisions of the act declaring that it was recommended by charles himself the act being passed and parliament being prorogued charles in compliance with the petition of the presbyterians which was supported by monk and manchester declared his intention of suspending its execution for three months now however he was deserted by clarendon who while glad to see a parliamentary recognition of the dispensing power 
would not as a constitutional lawyer favour a claim to an autocratic use of it by the crown and he only gave way when charles told him that his own honour was pledged to this course the vehement opposition of the bishops especially of sheldon the representative of the irreconcilable section of the church speedily convinced charles of the impossibility of success and the design was put aside the spectacle was presented of the presbyterians who usually placed the law above the prerogative calling upon the king to suspend the law by an unconstitutional use of power and of the bishops generally the staunch upholders of the prerogative resolutely opposing its exercise the presbyterians were determined to refuse the terms of uniformity they adhered to their determination in spite of liberal offers from the king of bishoprics and deaneries on sunday august seventeenth from all the presbyterian pulpits in the city the clergy who refused to conform preached their farewell sermons to crowded and sympathetic congregations and on the next sunday no fewer than two thousand clergymen the best of the great presbyterian body retired into voluntary poverty and professional exile henceforth presbyterianism was the creed not of a large part of the english church but of a dissenting sect the church of england had taken its final shape the shape which it holds to this day we get a glimpse of the difficulty of carrying out this act of uniformity and of its results in one part at least of the country from the reports of seth ward then bishop of exeter to sheldon in december sixteen sixty three he tells the archbishop that at least fourteen of the justices of the peace of devonshire alone are accounted errant presbyters and some of them esteemed as dangerous as any men within the diocese those therefore in exeter who have obeyed the laws have been checked and discouraged for their labour some of the most populous places had stood void he says ever since the passing of the act and complaints were almost universal either that they had no minister or a pitiful ignorant one or the minister hath complained of want of sufficient maintenance one minister whom he had put in prison had told him that after his removal he stayed some months to see whether any one would supply his place but at length finding that no man was put in his stead and that the people went off some to atheism and debauchery others to sectarianism for he is a presbyterian he resolved to adventure to gather his flock again and he had gathered a flock of fifteen hundred or two thousand on sunday last when he was taken from the pulpit and brought away number two first connection with france royal marriages sale of dunkirk the restoration of monarchy in england had been accomplished without the intervention of a single foreign power but scarcely was the crisis over before charles and the various continental governments sought to take mutual advantage of the change charles's object was a simple one it was to get money the revenue settled upon him by parliament was quite inadequate to the various calls of government the payment of debts incurred abroad the satisfaction of royalist demands and the expenses of his more disreputable pleasures still less was it sufficient to enable him to gratify the desire which he fitfully entertained throughout his reign of ruling as louis the fourteenth ruled of establishing an intelligent despotism independent of parliament founded upon armed force and the sympathy of dissent which might enable him to carry out his promised toleration of catholicism he determined therefore to secure his freedom from control by other means and this determination however unsteadily maintained is the keynote of his foreign policy throughout the reign his first application was to the dutch and from them as the price of an alliance he demanded two millions the renewal however of the navigation act of sixteen fifty one by which their carrying trade had in a great measure been destroyed formed an insuperable obstacle to union charles had plenty of alternatives for spain france and portugal were approaching him with rival offers 
in september sixteen sixty he let the spaniards understand that his alliance was merely a question of price they offered him whatever money he might want but they demanded that jamaica and dunkirk should be restored to them the proposal was at once refused and the plan for charles's marriage with the second daughter of philip the fourth being rejected by that monarch the negotiations were broken off with far greater satisfaction charles turned to france he was the son of a french princess and he had received great kindness from his cousin louis an alliance between the two crowns was from the dynastic and personal point of view obviously a natural one on louis's side considerations of statecraft pointed in the same direction at the peace of the pyrenees the french king had bound himself to give no aid to portugal then in rebellion against spain and he had acceded to the condition that that country should not be included in the treaty openly the promise was kept secretly it was systematically broken but louis now saw the means of supplying indirectly from england more effective help for many years the course of events had in general led to friendliness between portugal and england and a formal renewal of the alliance had been long under consideration in september of sixteen sixty a marriage was proposed between charles and the infanta catherine portugal offered as dowry the cession of tangier and bombay freedom of commerce in brazil and the east indies perfect religious liberty for english subjects in all portuguese territories and a sum of five hundred thousand pounds charles was in return to assist portugal with three thousand men and one thousand horses and to put eight frigates at her disposal to hinder this marriage spain had recourse to every device of intrigue and menace louis in turn spared no pains to accomplish a match by which without formally violating his engagements his old enemy could be so weakened the result was a signal victory of french influence the english privy council unanimously approved the marriage and the contract was signed on june twenty third sixteen sixty one in a speech couched in terms of studied insult to spain charles communicated his intention to the newly elected parliament and there too it was received with acclamation to enable him to carry out the terms of the contract louis sent charles a sum of eighty thousand pounds ten english men of war with three thousand men from the scotch garrison sailed to the portuguese coast even as early as january sixteen sixty two it was noticed that english protestant congregations had been established in lisbon two other marriages of importance took place in the royal family that between james and clarendon's daughter anne hyde had been secretly celebrated before the restoration it was now publicly acknowledged the personal connection with france was still more firmly cemented by the union of charles's favourite sister henrietta renowned for beauty wit and ability and intrigue and possessing great influence over charles himself with louis's younger brother the duke of anjou who afterwards became the duke of orleans by the portuguese marriage louis had made the first step in securing a hold on charles and thereby on english affairs but on the other hand it was by the vast commercial advantages it secured to england and from the aggressive alliance which it carried with it against the chief papal power of the world entirely consonant with the cromwellian policy of making us in dryden's magnificent phrase freemen of the continent very different was a step which emphatically marked the policy of isolation henceforth pursued and which formed another aid to the realization of french ambition as late as the summer of sixteen sixty one clarendon had urged upon the commons the necessity of maintaining dunkirk and the danger of its ever again being in hostile hands and parliament had proposed its perpetual annexation to the crown the expense incurred for the defence of portugal however the king's desire to be independent of parliament the absence of any wish for continental influence and the connection with france all contributed to suggest the advisability of raising money by the sale of the town to that power strong arguments were easily forthcoming it cost a hundred and twenty thousand pounds a year 
it brought no trade it had a dangerous harbour and its defence from the land side was extremely difficult on the other hand if it fell into an enemy's power it could easily be blockaded by england from the sea the cost of the maintenance of tangier jamaica and bombay and the probability of war with either france or spain if it were retained were dwelt upon clarendon at length gave way after some haggling the price was fixed at two hundred thousand pounds less than the cost of two years maintenance and in november sixteen sixty two to the great scandal of the protestant powers but with scarcely a dissentient in the privy council and without a murmur in parliament dunkirk was handed over to the french it was understood that the money was to be used not for the ordinary occasions of the crown but only for pressing accidents such as the quelling of an insurrection charles looked to it to provide himself with an army End of section eleven